Right now, I'd like to introduce Allison Posey. That's a great picture of you, Allison. Yeah, curriculum design specialist at CAST. And Allison specializes in the study of neurobiology and its impact and implementation in teaching. So please help me welcome Allison Posey. Hello. Woo, it is bright up here. Hello, happy, um, almost said happy Friday. Happy Thursday afternoon in Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm Allison Posey from CAS, and I'm really thrilled that you thank you for sticking with us through the session today. Um, I'm going to talk with you today about how we can, uh, can mitigate the effects of stereotype threat so all of our learners can achieve beyond our wildest ex expectations. Um, and I started thinking about, okay, this is a TED-style talk. How can I UDLize a TED-style talk? So I started thinking about some options for perception, options for action and expression, and options for engagement. So I have a Padlet site where you can visit and get a transcript, PowerPoints, link to research to build your background. I hope you draw, you chat, you tweet throughout the session, and post comments and share and start collaborating. So this will be available beyond the scope of just this short 18 minutes. And like all good UDL talks, I did want to start out just expressing my goals. So if at the end I don't achieve them, you can come and nag me and say, wait a minute, you didn't get to that goal. So I hope today to describe stereotype threat so you get what it is. But I also hope that I really share some good concrete strategies that you can take with you. In fact, I have six of them for you. And I really want to make it authentic. This matters. This topic really matters. So I invite you to reflect, what do you already know about stereotype threat? What do you already do about it? And who do you think it might impact? So that said, I just want to share, I was a high school science teacher for years and years, a predicament that I faced that is nothing new. I'm sure you've all faced this predicament. There have been books and research on this a lot. But I tended to notice like groups sitting together whether it was in the cafeteria, in the hallway, or the way that they would self-select groups in my class. And I didn't quite know how I felt about this, right? I didn't know, you know, is this great that there's this authentic connection that they're making? Is it something that I really should take action and mix them up a little bit? I recognized my role as a young white female teacher and thought I really didn't want to undermine any autonomy that they had. So it's been years since this predicament, and I still sometimes feel you know, those butterflies of, of discomfort. And so I put my new UDL hat on that I have now, and my years um, thinking about the UDL framework. And of course, I start wondering, well, what ultimately is my goal? And I realized my goal really was to remove any unnecessary inequities that there may have been in my context so that all of my learners could learn. So if that's my goal, if that's what I'm ultimately going for, I'm going to share some information with you about stereotype threat. And I want to see if you think that these strategies and the ideas that I'm going to share really might remove some of those inequities that are there. And should I start to mix up those groups or not? So stereotype threat is the worry that you might actually confirm a negative stereotype about an identity to which you belong and that you care about. That's actually something that's really important, that you care about that identity. So it's often subconscious. It's not like we're saying, ooh, I'm under stereotype threat right now. But it's very subconscious, and it can have unbelievable impacts on our performance, on our self-esteem, on our motivations, on our learnings, because we worry that one false move might confirm that negative stereotype about that group to which we care about. So I brought a little demo for today. So stereotypes affect identities that we value. So you can imagine the identities that you care about are like balloons. And they float around with us everywhere we go. Often these identities are invisible. We don't see them from the outside. But they represent our core values, our greatest strengths, and they're often the things to which we can be most vulnerable. Stereotypes are like the weights. This was great. I was, I was actually going to bring a weight for all of you, but that was going to be really heavy to bring through security. So <laughs> these weights are like stereotypes. And you can see they pull down our valued identities, right? And so 
I'm going to give you an example. I'm a working mom. You probably didn't see that on, my, um, on the front just from looking at me, but that's something I care very deeply about, being a working mother. So this is one of my valued identities. And one of the stereotype weights that's in the air is that working mothers are going to miss their kids' events because they're way too busy. And so I actually, I don't participate in any of the parent-teacher groups and gathering activities that happen at my kid's school. And then, you know, I started to think, wow, maybe this is one of those subtle impacts of stereotype threat. Because I care about being a working mother. And there is a stereotype that is subconsciously, subtly in the air. And it is impacting my behavior. So again, this wasn't a conscious thing that I was like, oh, because there's stereotype threat, I'm not going to participate. But it was subtle, and I do think it was impacting my behavior. So I'd like you to reflect for a moment on one of your identities that would be on your balloon. What's an identity that you value? And what stereotype weights are in the air that might be weighing down that identity? And how might it impact some of your behaviors? It's okay, it's a TED talk, but you can reflect for a moment. <laughs> What would you write on your identity balloon? What would be one of your stereotype threat weights? And how might it actually be impacting your behavior? So our students have these, right? And we often don't see their valued identities. And we don't know necessarily what stereotype threats are in the air that are impacting their behaviors and especially their learning. So it's really important that we start to think about these more. So stereotypes originate from our dominant culture. We see them everywhere in the media. It started to drive me crazy now how often I'm seeing it in the advertisements and the movies and the television shows. It's, it's, um, it originates in our family systems, our communities, our schools and our friendships are all impacting these stereotypes. And they do have an evolutionary origin that makes sense, right? If you look like me, you kind of talk like me, and we kind of hang out together, there's some safety in that number. And we're going to protect each other, and we're going to belong. So it makes sense evolutionarily. evolutionarily. And especially susceptible to stereotype threats, it's not who you always think. They are minority groups, but it can just be those who are fewest in number. And it tends to be at elite levels, and I've said this a number of times, it's for those who really care. They're the ones who are most susceptible. So I thought, here we are. We're at a very elite UDL conference. And those who may be fewest in number maybe are the UDL novices, folks who are brand new to UDL. And I started to think about what might be some of the subtle effects of the stereotype of being a UDL novice that just might be floating in the air and might be weighing down the care, that, so, that identity you have about universal design for learning and reaching all learners. Maybe it impacts your participation in some of the, the sessions. Maybe it impacts the number of selfies you take with David Rose, right? It might be really impacting some of these subtle behaviors. But they're there and they're real and they really impact. All ages and groups are susceptible. So they took white male math majors at Stanford and just primed them with a short newspaper article that said Asian Americans are really strong at math, and they saw an 18% decrease on their math test. So I want to show you a quick example um, of a little girl. This is from the movie um, uh, Man on Fire. And there is a stereotype threat in the air about an, that's affecting an identity that this little girl has. You can go ahead. Um, and I want you to see what behaviors you notice, and we're going to jump now into strategies that we're using to mitigate stereotype threat. So see what strategy Denzel Washington uses here with this little girl. Eyes closed. What happened? Did you see it? <laughs> Concentrating. Eyes are closed. What happened? 
flinched. You flinched. The gunshot holds no fear. Say it. The gunshot holds no fear. The gunshot holds no fear. Say it. The gunshot holds no fear. Louder. The gunshot holds no fear. Louder. The gunshot holds no fear. That's good. But you welcome the sound. In fact, it's the sound that sets you free. You are a prisoner on this block until that sound sets you free. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you set? Uh -huh. hey. Are you all ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? I know it's in the afternoon. No one's... How are you ready? Okay, thank you. <laughs> what was the identity she valued? Swimming. Yep, she valued swimming. What was a stereotype threat that might be in the air? If she's valuing swimming and she's a racer, what might she be nervous about? Being slow. Yeah, being slow off the block. She's nervous about being slow. She's this small, skinny girl standing all alone by herself on a block. She's terrified about being slow. She cares about swimming. She wants to be faster. A consequence. What happened? She flinched. Yeah, she flinched. And what might happen to her time? She'll get slower, and that might then self-affirm that stereotype that's subtly in the air. And what did Denzel Washington do? The gunshot holds no fear, right? The gunshot knows no fear. He started to prep her. He started to get her ready. And what I'm going to challenge you all to do today is that you're going to help all your learners know that their valued identity, their balloons, will know no fear. They'll know no fear. Because surprisingly simple, you guys don't have to go buy anything. Surprisingly simple strategies can mitigate the effects of stereotype threat and turn these stereotype knots into bows. It's actually a title of a fantastic research article. So first thing you can do, start to reframe tasks. When educators reframed that a little anxiety has been shown to help test performance, look at what happened in the test performance, especially for math significantly increased. The only difference was that one phrase that was said before the test. And believe me, before this TED talk, I thought, a little anxiety has been shown to help, right? <laughs> Reframing this task, educators reframed that a standardized test measures general problem solving as opposed to it being about intellectual ability. Watch what happens when they reframed. Here is the African-American score. Junk. Huge increase just from that reframing of that test. There are so many studies like this. This has been replicated over and over again. Second thing you can do is a really short self-affirmation activity with your students. Have them craft an identity narrative, one that really affirms their values, the groups, the beliefs, the goals, the relationships they have, so they start to see themselves as being complex and multifaceted. It makes them less vulnerable to one little stereotype threat. It's the simplest thing. Take a look at the effects it had. When this intervention was done, it actually stopped a downward grade trend among Latino Americans. So this purple line is the group that did not get the intervention. All they did was that 10-minute self-affirmation, and look, it started to close the achievement gap between the white and Latino Americans. All they did was that self-affirmation. Crazy simple, right? This third strategy, many of you know, it's the work of Carol Dweck. It gets its own checkpoint on the UDL guidelines, and that's to give mastery-oriented feedback. If we share this incremental growth-based growth theory of intelligence with our learners, that their brains are growing, that they can build these new neural connections when they're hard, um, solving hard problems, hard work and effort matter, Look at what happens. This group was given the incremental growth treatment. Their end of year grades over two years improved. Those who did not receive that treatment, it stayed the same. And what's more, the group that received that growth uh, mindset, they, said they reported that they enjoyed school more. Imagine that. Imagine enjoying coming to school. The learning actually follows. So to push on mastery-oriented feedback, because I figured a lot of you had heard that one already, there's another kind of feedback called wise feedback, and it goes so well with UDL, because it challenges us to have really high, rigorous, relevant goals for all of our learners and assure them that we're confident that they can achieve those high-level goals. So here's some feedback that was given on some papers, and to half of them, they added this wise, wise feedback where the professor said, I'm giving you these comments because I have high standards, and I know that through the hard work, effort, and the strategies, you can achieve them. 
And you can see the number of rewrites on this essay for both white students and African American students was dramatic, 22% and 55% rewrites. We know that learning happens from doing it and improving it and trying it again and again. The little ways that we give feedback make a huge difference. This strategy was interesting to me. You can take a look at some of the incidental cues that are just around the learning environment. So when they had females fill out a career interest survey, um, they had them fill out this survey in a stereotypically computer geeky room. And they went through a whole scientific process to, to define what they meant by computer geeky, stereotypical. And they decided it was Star Trek posters, Coca-Cola cans, and sci-fi books. So. <laughs> So you can see here um, the gray, the females did not report much interest in computer science courses. But all they did differently was change the poster to a nature poster, the Coke cans to water bottles, and the books to general fiction books. And all of a sudden, take a look at the light gray, junk, interest unbelievably higher in computer science. So Joni mentioned this this morning, but think about your leadership structures. Think about the role models that are presented in the environment. What's on your wall? What are the examples on your worksheets? And engage students in co-constructing the design of that so it's representative of the students in your learning environment. This is all free. It's so exciting. It's so impactful. Our perceptions are so easily influenced. You probably think this elephant has four legs. But if you look a little bit closer, it's much more complicated than that. Our brain is so goal-driven. We see what we want to see. And by reframing, reappraising, offering feedback, and paying attention to those incidental cues in the environment, we can impact perception and learning. So CAS did an experimental study that looked at the role of stereotype threat in eighth grade inquiry science classrooms. And they did a simple thing on the threat days they read a really short article about either women or low socioeconomic students underperforming in STEM. And on the non-threat days, they just did an innocuous nature reading. And what they found was so interesting. Both students, teachers, and independent observers rated the quality of collaboration to be lower. The red is on the threat days. The quality of collaboration was what was affected. It's like on those threat days, those students became that little girl standing all alone, vulnerable on the block again. And that collaboration was reduced. So they then followed up with the professional development training with teachers. And the favorite strategy that teachers really found impactful in their classroom was communicating with their students about emotions. And this can feel, again, really uncomfortable. Do I really want to know how you're feeling? Um, and they liked the mood meter, because the mood meter was really concrete and action-oriented. You just ask them, where are you? Where do you need to be to achieve this task? And what strategies will help you get there? And in a UDL environment, you have these strategies designed in the learning environment from the beginning. Options for engagement, action, and expression, and engagement. So what this research is all showing is nothing that exciting, but it's so powerful. There are social, emotional roots to stereotype threats. Our nervous system, and I make my brain, those of you who know me, here's my little brain model, our nervous system is constantly evaluating, is this good for me or bad for me? Under stereotype threat, you have increased blood pressure, sweat, the cortisol stress levels. It impacts your perception and strategic networks, and you have a decrease in working memory. In fact, your brain activation patterns will change. When told that men typically perform better on spatial awareness tests, you can see that, they, well, you can look closer at some other point, but you can see that there are differences in the brain activation patterns. It actually, um, these women were focusing more on social emotional cues than visual spatial um, awareness that was needed for that test. So even our brain pattern is affected by those subtle little cues that are in the learning environment. So I want to return to my, to my initial um, questioning about the students' groups. And I wonder, if we begin to implement some of these strategies and create an environment that is reducing stereotype threat, if we're doing this classroom by classroom, school district by school district, what might ensue? What sort of empower, empowerment might we, might we give to our students' social identities 
And how might we get rid of some of these stereotype weights that are pulling them down? What might, what might ensue? So here are the strategies, six of them. I want you to pick one now that you're going to try next week. Go ahead and pick one. And then I want you to do is try it out. Just try changing the posters. Just try reframing a task. Give some different feedback. And share out what you start to observe as being different in your students. Because we are all at risk. It, stereotype threat affects our skills, our collaboration, and the emotions that are absolutely essential for learning. And these strategies are so simple. But I recognize that stereotype threat is not a magic bullet. I started seeing its impacts everywhere. I was like, this is going to, this will save all of education. It's not a magic bullet. It's not. It doesn't negate the other inequalities or experience discrimination that is rooted in a whole history of experiences. I definitely recognize that. And I definitely recognize the variability in our learners. They all have different, important, valued identities that are often invisible to us. The stereotype threat pressures that are weighing them down, we don't know what they are. They're going to be so variable. And the mitigation strategies that work will be different for each of them. And instead of being overwhelmed by that, we can pull back and say, oh, this is where UDL is so beautiful, because we're going to put the burden on the design of the environment. And through offering these options for engagement, representation, and action and expression, we will reduce the stereotype threats that are in the air so that all of these valued identities can soar unencumbered, learning can have no limits, and all identity values will hold no fear. They'll hold no fear. So we're going to clip these out. We're going to set off all the fire alarms, let these balloons fly, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.